started here momentarily, then we'll have about 10 minutes of uh, Sunday school stuff, and then we'll get to the Bible. Good morning, let's take a seat. I was told that I need to speak loudly because apparently they can't hear me. <clears throat> and of course, as I try to project, it, the frog comes out. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, it's uh, a beautiful day that's going to turn very hot. So are we prepared? We're Texans, right? Yeah, we're used to it. <laughs> well, it's with, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, it with sad news that Will passed. And um, the, so Patsy has said, informed us that the funeral is going to be on Monday the 13th. Okay, and it's going to begin here at 9.30. They're going out to the VA for burial at 11, and then they're coming back here to church for the serve, um, for the luncheon. Okay. Um, on another note, the Lockhart said thank you very much. We delivered a um, meal to them on Friday. Did everybody get their my email? I didn't. Okay, um, Jeannie, Jeannie, yes. we're going to have to um, look at the distribution list again because on when you sent out the note, some people got the email and then other people did not and I was one that did not get the email and Jim did not get the email and a couple of other people here in the room did not get the email. Was it from you or from Jeannie? It, it came from Jeannie. It Jean. was from me, but it was her, her, her information was in the body. Okay. Did, okay. did everyone get the email that I sent out? How long did you go? I sent it out. It was Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. I sent out an email on Wednesday. Okay, so some people got it, some people did not. Did you have Southern Lake Andrews? Southern No, I... I don't have a sudden link address, so. If you didn't get it, mail. give me your email address and I'll check it. Yeah. They might look in your junk mail sometimes. Yeah, look in your spam. Sometimes it goes to spam. Yeah. So they said a thank you for all of us to to all of us for providing a meal for them on Friday night. Speaking of. Um, we just are going to put the basket out. I know it's last minute. If um, the basket with the handle is back there at the table, so if you want to add to the kitty 
go ahead and put that, we'll have it out for the next couple of Sundays, okay? Um, and then on a final note, I got a call yesterday from Clara, and she said they are in, they were in Montana, they were spending the night in Butte, Montana, and they should be in Idaho today. <laughs> so good news, they finally are landing, um, they've had a good trip. Her niece and nephew joined them in Missouri and <coughs> then picked up the journey with them. So they're taking their car. So there's two vehicles now. There's two extra drivers, and they are able to make it to, um, they've taken the burden off of Claire and David, and they're driving. So that was good news. <coughs> so do we have any other news that we need to share with everybody? Yes, I'm here. You're here. Congratulations. We are so here. Glad you're plane. here, Jose. This is your plane. Oh, that's fine. Sure. Mm. Okay. <laughs> hey. 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 Yes, Sue. This is probably in the email, in the prayer list, but Betty McLaughlin, she's, she uh, had a an episode in the doctor's office, and we hurried quickly over to the ER. And she was in atrial fibrillation, okay. and we went to the doctor's office more for her pain in her hips, you know. So thank goodness we went to the doctor's office, and the atrial fib was discovered. Okay. So we were two blocks from the ER, and I was thanking God all the way. You know. Were you escorting her? I was, but that's oh, not important. Wow. That, that's not important. The important thing is that we were two blocks from the ER. And now she's gone home with Jerry. Okay. That's her son. Until Brenda gets back, she's on a, <laughs> she's on a cruise. <laughs> she's, got, she's way over in the rest of the world somewhere. We don't even know. I don't even know where she is right now. She went to the Holy Land. And now she's with her sister. The two of them are together. So I said, why can't we call Terry? And she's, she's with Brenda. <laughs> so then it's Jerry. Here is the sister. Okay. So she's gone home with Jerry, and she had an MRI yesterday, and of the sense, I do not know the results. Okay. But she's, I wouldn't say she's better. I would say that she's getting care. She's, getting care. Yeah. Yeah. she's so, better than she was <laughs> at the doctor's office. For those of you who did not hear, um, Sue was with Betty McLaughlin last week, had an episode in the doctor's office, went to the emergency room, She's had a lot of tests done, and she is now with her son, Jerry, not Terry, yes. but Jerry, and yes. will be there being taken care of for now while her daughter is out of town. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't, ha I guess it's news. I have an invitation for everyone uh, on June 13th in the evening, the evening of <coughs> Will's uh, memorial that morning. Uh, is the annual, the 30th annual Music Teachers Association concert, showcase concert. It benefits Harmony Family Services, but there are seven pianos being played at the same time. Oh, really? Some of the students are in cute little costumes. There's soloists, there's some original composition, and it's less than an hour, and... <laughs> Where is it located? It's just right in the sanctuary. Okay, so... There's a sign outside on the, by the door. Okay, so Sherry said keep um, the 13th on your calendar. What time? 7.30. 7.30, if you want to hear the beautiful concert. Uh, we'll be here before dark. <laughs> <laughs> and hear all the different pianos being played. Seven different pianos. Huh? At the same time. At the same time. So. Same song? <laughs> what? Same song? <laughs> Actually, yes. Yes. <laughs> we hope they're playing the same song. <laughs> there, there's several of them. High school, post 12, elementary, middle school, it's different levels, but all of them play the same song at the same time, and it usually sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> they hope that it's going to sound so. So it is Monday night, the 13th, here in our sanctuary. Oh, okay. okay. So keep casual that in mind. dress, don't dress up. Yeah, okay, because you can come in your shorts if you want. <laughs> What time did you say it started? 7.30. 7.30. Okay. Bring your own drinks. 
You may need them. Right, bring your own earplugs. <laughs> We're not that loud. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Delbert. We need to remember the Patsy uh, Rogers and the passing of Will. Yeah. I think you missed the announcement. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> That's okay. The announcement was you for those that came in life. late. They, um, Will Rogers' service is going to be on the 13th, Monday the 13th, starting at 9.30. We'll go out to the VA at 11 and then back here at the church for the meal. Okay? Anything else? All right, I'm going to pass it on to Jim. I hope everybody heard me today. Did everybody hear me? Yes. Hope the people hear me. Yeah, let's hope they hear me. Is working. I don't think it is. I don't know where the on button is even. It's Technology. on the back. Is it on the back? Mm -hmm. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Testing. Still not. Put the lights on. There we go. Okay. Had to warm up. That sounds better. All right. Well, what a week it's been. It finally rained. Um, I was out during one of the evenings this week when the storms came through, and one of my favorite experiences, probably since I was a kid, was always going out in the night and watching a storm slowly roll in and seeing the lightning. And then when the front gets closer, the wind kicks in and it blows your hair around. And it's just, it's just a real cool experience. You usually get into the house before it starts the downpour, but just the arrival of the storm is always really cool. So I did that this week. I was out sometime during one of the evenings and listening to the trees whistle and the wind pick up and the lightning, and it didn't rain. <laughs> so that's, that's probably not uncommon here in Texas as well. As a storm come by and oh yes, oh yes, and then no. no. But it rains somewhere in town. Your fronts down here, are, your rain is very specific in where it goes. In Illinois, it's a, it's a big front that we would get. It would come in, everybody would get it, even though when it arrives. But here it's just really spotty. So it's kind of interesting how that works. But I still got to enjoy the wind blowing what's left of my hair. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you probably noticed when it gets about 10 yeah. miles from Abilene, it splits and goes around. Yeah, I've heard that. Exactly. I've, heard, I've heard the story about the, the Indian curse on Abilene and storms have a tendency to come up to Abilene and split because some Indian curse will land or something like that. that always it must have got Truby in there too. <laughs> what? Is that what it is? A Truby miss it too? Truby missed it too. I mean, he we was got at Truby when it missed, when it just thundered. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, some places will get an inch or two, and some places just won't get anything. You just get a lot of dust blowing around. You can see a lot of that down here. Anyway, that kind of leads into what I was going to talk about. So I was out one of these evenings at two thirty in the morning. The beagle decided to wake me up and tell me he wanted to go out in the backyard and uh, sniff around and do his business. So while I was out there at 2.30 in the morning, um, I could hear a mockingbird. And a mockingbird is unfortunately right outside my wife's bedroom window and uh, it keeps her up at night sometimes. It's just singing away and it's like, wow, what a beautiful song that is. They don't have a specific <laughs> tune or pattern, but their voice is really pretty. And it's just going away at 2.30 in the morning like it's just nobody's business. And it reminded me of um, when I was back at school down at Bob Jones University uh, in our Preacher Boys class, there was a uh, devotional by Spurgeon called Songs in the Night. And it was just a, a bunch of little devotionals that he wrote for his students to read and meditate on. And I was thinking about how that bird reminded me of Songs in the Night. And sure enough, so I looked up Songs in the Night in the Bible and it's mentioned twice, and one of them is in the book of Job. It says, Job 35.10, but no one says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? The other one is in Psalms. It says, I remembered my songs in the night, 
and my heart meditated, and my spirit asked, and then he goes on to mention questions about where is God during my sad times. And metaphorically speaking, songs in the night, this is a good time to think about that because there's so much bad stuff going on in America, and fires and school shootings and just discord going on. And I think about God, our maker, giving us songs in the night. Metaphorically, it's talking about during your darkest hours, God gives you a song in the night. And it's a good thing. And it's a good thing to remember that God does that. I'm thinking about meditating more and more on the fact that God gives us songs during our darkest hours when we can't find rest and we're restless and it's in the middle of the night. We can find peace in God's word. And it's just a wonderful thought to think about. Anyway, with that, let's have a word of prayer and let's get started. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you do give us songs in the night. When things look their bleakest, we need to reflect on you and the things that you've done for us. We know that you're looking always to do good for us, Lord, and we just want to praise you when you do good things. But even when things get tough, help us to realize that it's not because you're trying to punish us, you're trying to mold us to be more like your son. Now bless our class today again as we look at Job and the questions that are raised in the book of Job. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And as we think about these things, may we learn more about your nature and your loving kindness to us. We pray in thy precious name. See everybody. Saw a bunch of you at the Lockhart thing yesterday, and they got some special people in the room. So glad to have you here. My my favorite student, Betty Sue Clemmer. Good to see you there, Betty Clemmer. Good to see. You. Glad to have you here. Uh, also, uh, in the back row there, are Jerry and uh, Jerry Holman's son, Greg, is with us today. Hello, Greg. Glad to have you here with us. So we just have all kinds of people here. Got uh, that man Warren guy who's still hanging on. He was trying to qualify for this class. He's not quite up to the level. Well, I'm going to need a song in the night tomorrow when he leaves. Okay. <laughs> so we'll call and sing to you. Is that right? Oh, yikes. <laughs> we'll, have seven, we'll have seven pianos playing at the same time. Hopefully the same song. Right. In the right key. That's right. <laughs> it kind of sounds like the, the celebration singers, they sometimes sing seven songs at the same time that are different, but that's okay. Speaking of, I found, of course, in the newspaper, here's our world-famous Rose. She's singing away right here. Way to go, Rose. And got a couple of celebration singers down here singing. And there's Sister Tucker from our church right there. So this is just a great class. We could, we could do everything with this class. We can do the music. Get that for others back there. Uh, we can do the music. We can do the preaching. We can do the Bible stuff. We can do the hospital visitation. We can do everything. We'll just form our own little church. What is it all about? Okay, good. We have people of high-level dignity like uh, Joe Fresh, and so we're in good shape. <laughs> Working with Joe yesterday. We went by to see uh, Patsy yesterday. And so a lot of uh, things were already planned, ready to go for the funeral that we were talking about. So she's, uh, she's a great, great lady, and Will was a great, great guy. So lots of, after I talked to you last Sunday, I went over to uh, Arlington, spent a couple of days over there seeing the mom and seeing the sister, and, and things progress in life, and so we continue to move on best that we can. We did Bible school. Got a lady wearing the Bible school uniform up here. Spark Studios. You'll see a lot of those in church today. They took down our decorations, if you remember from last week. So, but uh, it's just amazing how life continues. It's been a month since I've seen you. Last time I saw you was May. It's now June. So, uh, we are carrying on best that we can. Still on the back table, there are uh, all kinds of... Uh, Open windows and mature living and home life and study books on Job. 
some outlines, there's a hat, and there's a plate. So if you need any of those things. I claim the plate. You, you want the plate? Yeah. Okay, good. Plate's already gone, sorry. All right, so uh, it, it's interesting to watch how things continue to develop in this class. Uh, they've got the machine turned around the different direction this time, so I could be backwards. I could be saying things uh, in reverse. I'll so turn to the book of Bodge. <laughs> <laughs> That's Joe spelled backwards. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> Sometimes you have to work with people. Yeah. <laughs> See, my wife tells kind of. I call them, she, her delivery is third grade delivery. She'll tell me something that's sort of funny, and then she'll say, did you get it? <laughs> and that's the way a third graders tell their stuff. So Anyway, let's take a look here at the anniversaries. What day is today? Sunday. Sunday, 5th of June. June. There was a song, the 5th of never. Wasn't that a song? Well, it was a song. I'm a week early on that song. Fifth was seven days earlier. Yeah, that's right. All right, so 5th of June. All right, June the 10th. So I guess that's going to be like Friday. June the 10th is uh, the anniversary of J.L. and Diane Cole. You know those people? Yes. They're great, great people. The Coles are. All right. That ought to cover it for next week. Birthdays, June the 5th, today. Donna Broyles. When we were in the chapel, she used to sit like right over there. But Donna Broyles uh, on the 5th. The 9th, which I guess is Thursday, Lonnie Hicks. Lonnie Hicks having a birthday there. So that's the two that we have uh, this coming week for the birthdays. So, uh, since he came in the room, I should tell you this is not a uh, McClarty tie. <laughs> Sorry. That's how I have him categorized in my closet. All right. Looks like if you want a good seat, you're going to have to get here early for you. The back row of seats here. All right, so we are progressing. We're making pretty good time. Things will pick up a little quicker as we get to the last half of the book. And uh, what I keep hearing from other people is that stuff like, whoa, this is making me think. Making me think about life, making me think about how we minister to people. Others are saying, oh, I, I never knew that phrase was in there before. Or we sing a hymn that's based kind of on what that has to say in the book of Job. Uh, what chapter are we up to? Yeah, 21. It's 20, oh, 22, that's right. <laughs> Since we're doing things in reverse, 22 <coughs> is where we'll be. Uh, so chapter 22, how many chapters in Job? 42. <coughs> 42? Okay. But again, you're going to see today, everything begins to change today from a literary standpoint. And so as you heard in the prayer, uh, we had had... The first cycle kind of talked about why suffering happens, why the bad things happen to good people, and everybody's taking turns talking, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job, and they just wrestle with these issues. The second uh, cycle kind of dealt with what's going to happen to the wicked people, why are the bad people winning, are they ever going to get what we think they should get? And so again, Eliphaz and Job and Bildad and Job and Zophar and Job. So when you come up to 22, well, let's say I probably ought to get to chapter 22 myself. Might even be good if I got to the book of Job myself. Here we go, I finally made it. Ooh. Larry. What? Uh, some of the uh, people on um, Zoom said the sound is worse now and they can't even hear you very much. That so. sounds like a plus to me. <laughs> so I don't know if it would help if the... Turn that down? Sound was on. Oh. Let me ask her. Okay. okay. Well, Jeannie, you might go grab CV or something if you see him and pass that along. Okay. And they'll, they'll take care of it. Maybe... Uh, 
That's what happens when you work with old people. They can't hear things very well. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay, good. We could be in danger, though, this lady is messing with us now. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep talking. All right, anyway. So when you come to chapter 22, we are going to enter our third and actually last cycle uh, of the conversation between Job and his friends. Uh, this one is mainly going to deal with the sinfulness of Job. Uh, we don't care what you've said, Job. We think you're sinful because this stuff has happened to you. But this third argument is actually the shortest of the arguments. The, the arguments get smaller as you go along. Uh, the first one had about 299 verses, and the second one had about 186 verses, and this one's only going to have 115 verses. It also is different in that it's going to start like normal. Chapter 22 should be from Eliphaz. Yes. Is that what your Bible says? Okay. And then chapter 23 and 24 are going to be Job's response. That's normal. That's normal. That's normal. You look at chapter 25, I'm just setting you up for where we're going, and you'll notice chapter 25 is Bildad starting to talk, but he didn't talk very much. How many verses? Six. Six. That's all he's got. Maybe he had already said everything he knew. <laughs> I think I'll just sit down. Uh, and then the third guy, what's the third guy? So far? He didn't talk at all. So this third one is a little bit different. So uh, we'll see how that's going to develop as we take a look at it. While we do that, uh, Dottie will keep punching on her phone, and the world-famous CV has entered the room to solve all of our problems. So, but we'll keep... That's not what I do. It's in your job description. I read it. All right. So back to chapter 22, just so we can take a quick look at what some of these people are saying. And uh, you'll also notice some of the style will change a little bit. Uh, instead of always having two line verses, you'll pick up some three line verses. So everything's just a little bit different in this third stage of uh, this third cycle between, between the friends. Eliphaz, chapter 22. Can a person be of benefit to God? Can even a wise person benefit him? What pleasure would it give the Almighty? Notice he just keeps cranking out these questions here. He sort of has skipped all of the normal courtesies he usually does and just started asking questions. Um, he wants Job to realize, Job, you keep talking about how your blameless, upright, fears God, turns away from evil, more we're used to thinking of. Um, but... You sure that's really important? Can you even can you do anything that makes God's life better? This is sort of what Eliphaz is saying. Now, I think what we know is sure the way we live is to bring pleasure to God. The way God loves us is to be involved in a relationship with us. But he Eliphaz seems to think Job's trying to bargain with him or something. Like, okay, God, I'll do this and this and this, and this will make you happy, and thus then you'll treat me nice and now that's that's sort of how the traditional what was that phrase we've used Deuteronomic wisdom occurred is they thought I do good God does good to me and I think I know people like that today who think okay I'm gonna I want to get God on my side so I guess I'll go to church three times next week and maybe give uh, eleven percent instead of ten percent and I'm gonna get God on my side. Well, that's, that's all built into the thing <clears throat> that we tend to call religion. You know, what do I do? What can I do to make God like me better? What can I do to bargain with him? What can I do to get on his good side? <coughs> and again, what Job is finding out, and what we find out, of course, by working through the book, is that we're not supposed to have a religion. We're supposed to have a relationship with God. He loves us, we love him, we live for him, no matter what happens in our life. We're up front with him, we talk to him. Who was I talking to? Yeah, I think uh, I was talking to this lady and she told me that God has given her permission at times to kind of vent when she's not happy. Okay, that's good. Get out there and tell God what you think. I think he's big enough to handle it. 
you know, when, when we uh, love God and God loves us, we have this great relationship with him. But see, Eliphaz is kind of saying, well, yeah, what would you gain, verse 3 says, what would he gain if your ways were blameless? You know, that's what we learned about Job is that he was. And so, there's a question, there's a question, Chapter uh, verse 4 is a question, verse 5 is a question. So he's just jumped right into questioning God, uh, sorry, to questioning Job, and sort of almost saying <coughs> sarcastically that uh, you, know, you don't seem to be getting your way, and you don't seem to like it. Is, it, is not your wickedness great, verse 5 says, or not your sins endless? See, this is the theme of this third cycle. Job, I don't care what you've said and what we've said, it boils down to the fact you're sinful. That's why God has smacked you with all these things that we learned back in those earlier chapters. So Eliphaz has always been in the book. He's been the, the face of traditional religious belief, nice package, we got it all figured out. You know, I think there's one thing we've learned, all of us, as we get older, it's not always what we've figured out. Uh, things happen that we would not predict. Things happen we don't like. Things happen we don't understand. And sometimes when it doesn't fit our package, we get mad. We turn away. But we have to realize again, God's bigger than whatever religion we want to come up with. So, but Eliphaz is that image of saying, you must be sinful because these things happen to you. He brought up a list of things Job had done wrong. Verse 6, you demanded security from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary. Now, we don't know if any of that's true. None of that's ever come up in the book that Job has been harming people, treating people unjustly. Maybe that's just what Eliphaz is assuming that that's happened. Have you ever done that before? You assume some people have done something and they haven't done it? Yeah. Or people have assumed that you've done something and you haven't done it? Yeah, you got to be careful about that kind of thing. But Eliphaz is, is just sort of cranking out stuff. He has no evidence. Doesn't seem to bother him. And it's kind of a rich people list of sins. What did rich people do? They wanted security. They stripped people of clothing. They held, withheld water. Though you're a powerful man, verse 8. You know, you're sending widows away, verse 9. So these are like what, back in that day, they were uh, kind of what you would call rich people sins. And for the typical Hebrew lifestyle back in those days, rich were getting richer, poor were getting poorer. There wasn't a lot of middle ground anymore. So it's interesting to see what he's accusing God, uh, Job of doing. So not, not a good chapter, if you will, because of what's taking place uh, as he's trying to bring Job to confess. Fess up, buddy. That's sort of what he's, what he's telling him here. Larry, would yep. those not be false accusations since Eliphaz has no way of knowing whether or not that's true? Well, sure. Uh, yeah, whether or not they're true or not, they could be false accusations. I, I can't imagine that Job would have done any of those things. None of that occurred in the book. But again, that's what we do. We make things fit our preconceived ideas. That's what Eliphaz is doing. Go ahead, Rose. A traditionalist would think he must have done these things because look what happened to him. Right, right. It's, it's judging the cause from the effect. Yeah, the... What's that phrase we used to use? The proof is in the pudding. You know, you keep talking about this stuff, but you got smacked. So you must have done something bad. So I'll bring up the list of something bad. You know, it's kind of like the famous story that we all know that Jesus told the parable of the lost son. You know, the younger son took his stuff, wasted it, came back home. And the older son said, well, look, you know, he squandered your estate, and he spent it all doing this and this and this and this, and we don't know that. I think the older son kind of just sort of invented what the younger son did. We like to accuse people, and we like to assume that they've done things that perhaps they haven't done. Back to ministry. How do we minister to people? Are we looking to judge them or looking to help them? Uh, Friday was at City Light again, and 
Patty was there, and Patty played the piano, and then she even jumped up and started preaching. So way to go, Patty. Good job on the preaching. <clears throat> and then she left her piano playing classes over there. But anyway, the, uh, we can sit in there and judge all those people. This happened to you because you did this. What good does that do? It doesn't. And, but you try to help the people, that's ministry. That's good stuff. That's doing what we're called to do to help people along the way. So I, don't, I think that's the point when you read the book. Hopefully we're becoming less like Eliphaz. So you see Job's response is going to start in chapter 23. And you see it's, uh, again, he's going to get two chapters to respond. Of course, it is his book, but also these chapters are smaller anyway. Oh, even today my complaint is better, bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. Verse 3 is kind of like the cry that everyone makes. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwellings. See, Job seems to have this idea back to, back to not religion, but back to a relationship. If only I could go and talk to him. That's what he wants to do. You know, you guys are talking to me. You three have come to be with me. You spent a week with me, and now we're talking, and I really would like to talk to God. <coughs> How many times, verse 3, have you said, if only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his book. I could state my case before him. I'd fill my mouth with arguments. So his, he has anguish in his life. Again, we're all, we've all been there. Some of us may be there even now. But he's just looking to, wanting to talk to God. See, here again, when we're on this side of the cross, you know, we get to talk to Jesus, the Holy Spirit's filling <coughs> us. Job said, I need, I just want to talk to God. That's what our prayer is all about, talking to God. Patty? I, I just have a question. Some places in the Bible, they capitalize the he or the his when they're talking about God, but they're not doing that here. Is there some rule about that, or just a very wide book? Or <laughs> There's a rule. Sorry, I didn't put religion back there. There's a rule. Uh, yeah, the whole thing about capitalization of pronouns is merely a uh, translation decision by whoever's uh, printing the Bible. Uh, in Hebrew, they don't have capitals and lowercase letters in the first place. And when you read the New Testament, uh, only the names of people are capitalized. The aces, Jesus is capitalized, but when it says he went into town, the he is not capitalized. So, but what happens is I think that the, the English translators, to honor God and to make sure you wouldn't mess up some of the antecedents, they decided to capitalize pronouns about God. But again, that's entirely a, a translation decision. <coughs> We are going to we are going to teach Hebrew in the fall at Hardin Simmons. Many of you may want to come and take it. <laughs> what do you mean my brain doesn't work that way? Anymore? In fact, probably Billy could teach it. He's probably taught Hebrew before. All right. So that's what he wants to do. He wants to go talk to God, and that's a good thing to do. He wants to talk to God. He wants to show God that he's, that, he, that he's obedient to him. So you come down to verse uh, 11. My feet have followed closely his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have, not tre I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. And there's one thing I've learned, I think, the more we read Job. The phrase we've always used in history is uh, the patience of Job. Have you heard that phrase before? So-and-so has the patience of Job. Well, also I, at times I hear a little bit about the pride of Job. Um, that, that's going to come around at the end of the book also. 
But you almost, like I say, you, if you put yourself in his sandals, you kind of feel where he's coming from. I, I've been doing the things that I think I'm supposed to do. I've kept to his ways. I've not departed. I've treasured his words. But, verse 13, he stands alone and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. Now, if you want to underline something in your Bible, that's a good one. The second half of verse 13. He does whatever he pleases. Next time you think you have God figured out, realize you're wrong. <laughs> you don't have him figured out. We get glimpses of his glory, glimpses of his grace, glimpses of his mercy. I think if we understood everything there was to understand about God, it wouldn't be God. But he does whatever he pleases. So he continues on into chapter 24. Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? See, he's just looking for an ending time. He kind of wants it to be over. He, and, and I think he's answering it. Remember when Eliphaz was telling him all the things that he must have done, all those sins earlier? Job says, well, let me list some sins. I'll list some sins of the wicked, starting in about verse 2, 24 2. There are those who move boundary stones. They pasture flocks they have stolen. They drive away the orphan's donkey, take the widow's ox in pledge. So he's listing the sins of the wicked. That thing about boundary stones, you know, we're West Texas people, we know about land. And the Hebrews had boundary stones, and that said that's where your land went to, and that's where mine starts. So sometimes somebody might go out and slide the stone over a little bit further. <laughs> you know, that's why we invented barbed wire, wasn't it? Or something like that. So they couldn't do that. <clears throat> so he says, you want to talk about sin? This is the, I can tell you real sins. And those people seem to be doing okay. They pasture flocks they have stolen. They thrust the needy from the path, verse 4 force all the poor of the land into hiding. So, it just doesn't seem fair. We talked about that the other day. That's something I got to think about. When we say something's not fair, who has decided what fair is? I guess we've decided what fair is. And I don't know if we're supposed to be making that decision. Well, that's not fair. And what would you always tell your kid? Who said life had to be fair? That's right. Uh, well, Mom, everybody else has one. That's not fair. You say, if everybody else jumped off a cliff. <laughs> these are all in the parents' uh, handbooks. You know, yeah. <laughs> And then they say, well, maybe how many are jumping? What's at the bottom? How far is it? And then you say, don't smart off, go to your room. And they stomp down the hall and slam the door. Then they get in trouble for slamming the door. That's right. <laughs> There's a pattern to life here. I'm just telling you. So that's what he's responding with in chapter 24. Uh, he talks about, come down to about verse 13. He kind of uses the image of, uh, of light and darkness. There are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways or stay in its paths. Here's some of those verses that have three lines. Remember I told you almost all of them have two lines. These have three lines. When, day, when daylight is gone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you who works on the darkness, he says. When daylight is gone, the murderer rises up, kills the poor and needy. In the night, steals forth like a, a thief. The thief likes to work at the night. The eye of the adulterer, there's another sinner at the, at the nighttime, watches for dusk and he thinks, oh, no eye will see me. And he keeps his face concealed. And in the dark, thieves break into the house. By day, they shut themselves in. They want nothing to do with the light. For all of them, midnight is their morning. And they make friends with the terrors of darkness. Hmm. At 2.30, they take their dog outside. Uh, yeah, but see, that's what he's trying to say is light and darkness. And Job's trying to indicate that he's trying to live in the light compared to these obviously evil people 
who are living in the darkness. Now, verse 18, Pat, uh, Patty brought up what Bibles say. Verse 18 might just have Job still talking, or, or your Bible might say, uh, yet you say, do any of you have a yet you say or anything like that? Okay. Because verses 18, 19, 20, they kind of echo what his friends have been saying. So people have wondered, is Job now sort of agreeing with them on some of this stuff? Or is he just saying, that's what you guys think? So, it's just an interesting literary thing. Well, he wraps up his argument against Eliphaz. Come down to verse 23. He may let them rest in a feeling of security, but his eyes are on their ways. Again, talking about the wicked. For a little while they are exalted, and then they are gone. They're brought low and gathered up like all others. They're cut off like empty <coughs> grain. If this is not so, who can prove me false and reduce my words to nothing? It's all right, Elphaz, I've responded to you. You prove that I'm blind. You prove that I'm wrong. It's, sort of, it's getting kind of uh, more confrontational as these guys are talking. So, Chapter 25. Now, you told me chapter 25 is a short chapter. Is that right? Yes. How many verses? Six. Six. So this is, again, one of the changes of the cycle. <coughs> Normally, everybody gets their speech laid out. On and on and on it goes. We've done three. We've done three. We've now done one. Here's the second one, but it's short. So Bildad's going to just have the short one. And really, it's, uh, it's just a repeat pretty much of all the stuff he said before. Maybe that's why it's short. I got nothing. <laughs> I'll just sit down. Uh, what he said. So he just says a little bit. Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? On whom has his light not risen? So I mean, these are just theological cliches that he's done before as he lets Job know that Job must be wrong. Uh, how can a mortal, verse 4, how can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less a mortal who is but a, my Bible says, maggot. Did you say maggot? A human being who is only a worm. You got worm? Remember, we changed that in a hymn. For such a worm as I. Yeah, for such a worm as I. There's another one, Rose and I were talking about how some hymns kind of pick up on things out of Job. But we changed it. What did we change it to? A sinner such as I. I guess that sounds better than worm. Okay. I can't think of any hymns that have the word maggot in them. But anyway. So it's like... It's like uh, Bill Dad to say, oh, I'll keep this quick. God's everything. You're a worm. You're a sinner. Shut up. Take your lumps. Do better. That's sort of what he says. So I get maybe that's why it's quick. God's awesome majesty is much better than your disputations that you want to claim that you're okay. So, you know, I'm done. It didn't take very long. So Job will get a reply. His reply is even a little shorter than his normal replies in chapter 26. I think Job gets a little sarcastic here. How you have helped the powerless. <laughs> How you have saved the arms of his people. What advice you have offered to one without wisdom. You have great wisdom, and I don't. That's sort of what he's saying. I think he's a little sarcastic, not happy with what's going on. So Job does have some positive things to say about God. Picking up on what Bill, remember Bill Dye is talking about the awesomeness of God. So Job talks about creation a little bit. That's a great thing God did. He, he Talks about his awesomeness, uh, verse uh, 6, the realm of the dead is naked before God, destruction lies uncovered. 
He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Do uh, you have nothing in verse 7? Yes. Yeah, well, I got words. No, no. You have the word nothing? Yes. Okay. Empty space. Empty space? Okay. Yeah, the Hebrew word there, tohu, not tofu, that's something else that nobody likes. <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever had to. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. I haven't missed much. Uh, yeah, tohu is absolute nothing. It's nothing. And what's why that's important, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about God creating, God created out of nothing. Now, you want to create something. A lot of you people in this room create things. Uh, we were at a choir party last night where people created desserts, which had to have some ingredients to work with. Some of you can create furniture. you got to have stuff to work with. Some of you can create music, but you have to have something to work with. But the, the Hebrew perception is that God took absolutely nothing and made it something. And only God can do that. Only God makes things. Bara is the Hebrew word. Only God creates things out of nothing. His awesomeness. So see, I think that's, you know, Job says, you want to talk about his awesomeness? Sure, we can do it. I'm with you on that. Verse 8, he wraps up the water in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight over Truby. <laughs> It doesn't rain. No. No. <laughs> he covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it, marks out the horizon. The pillars of heaven quake, verse 11. Larry? Yep. Only God can speak matter into creation. Okay, that's true. It's chapter 1 account. Oh, Genesis. Comment, please, on. What? Verse, verse 12. He yep. Right Yes, that is the word Rahab. It's not the Rahab that you think of. Okay. The lady in the book of Joshua. Okay. It's uh, one of the uh, terms used for uh, an opponent, a sea monster kind of a thing. And, okay. right. 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 Some of you may even have things below the line. <laughs> Pride. <laughs> huh? Pride. Okay, good. There you go. Yeah, it's usually... It's used earlier in Job, back in chapter 9, to talk kind of about a sea monster. So he wraps it up in verse 14, and these are but the outer fringe of his works. You know, that's an interesting thought. As great and as wonderful as everything you and I can say about God, and there are great and wonderful things we can say, that's only the fringe of what he does. Back to a reminder that he is far more whoa, than we've ever thought about <coughs> things being. Leave those there. I'll get them later. <coughs> I'll view that as my exercise for the day. <laughs> okay, now, chapter 27. Job is going to continue. Now, here's where everything has changed because we're normally thinking, okay, Eliphaz had his turn. Bildad had his turn. Who's next? Who's the third guy? So far. So far. But there is no so far. So, I don't know if he's quit or if he just decides not to talk. And so what happens is we, we are set up to the fact that we're entering a new literary part of the book. Because if you'll notice how chapter 27 begins and how chapter 29 begins... They began with an extra little heading. Mine says, and Job continued his discourse. You say something like that? Yeah. yeah. See, it's never said that before. So it's like, okay, we've kind of finished this. Job. In fact, you will not hear from the friends again. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, not going to make another appearance in the book to talk to Job. So that part's now done. So we're shifting gears, and we're going to give Job the stage again. 
So Job's going to get oh a number of chapters all the way through 31. Job has kind of got the stage to himself. So again, if you don't think of him dramatic or theater style. Lights have gone down elsewhere. Job is out there in the middle. He's going to talk. So he's going to continue, it says. And he starts off by saying a positive thing and then perhaps a negative thing. Verse 2, as surely as God lives. Now that's a great statement of faith. God lives. I'm thinking of him again. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. He lives. No matter what men may say. So that's a positive thing. He knows God lives. But then he says, he's denied me justice, though. The Almighty who made my life bitter, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips... Will not say anything wicked, my tongue will not utter lies. So, he knows God lives, and yet he thinks he's not getting a fair shake out of the deal. In fact, I noticed in my Bible, in yours in verse 2, does it use the word justice? Yes. Okay. What's your definition of justice? Getting what you deserve. Yeah, what you deserve, that's justice. Yeah. It goes back to the religion. You get what you deserve. I've been doing good. God, give me good. Um, in our more humble times, do we want justice from God? <laughs> no. We want, what was the word you said? Mercy. Mercy. But see, again, Job seems to be banking on the fact that he's not getting justice. Because I'm going to hold on, verse 6, I'm going to maintain my innocence, I'm never going to let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. So here's the start of his speech. Again, I hear a little bit of uh, pride, if you will. He says, I really kind of wish my enemies were like the wicked, verse 7. My adversaries would be like the unjust. Job's been defending himself against his friends. I'll tell you what, verse 11, I will teach you about the power of God. The ways of the Almighty I will not conceal. You've all seen this yourselves. Why all this meaningless talk? So maybe that's what he's going to do. So you guys have been trying to teach me. Maybe I'll now try to teach you. Maybe that's why we have these 27, 28, 29, 30, five chapters in a row of Job trying to teach his buddies. Come down to about verse 13. Now usually they, people will say 13 through 23 it's kind of the classic view of this religious suffering that we've seen in the book so far. So you can go back to it. It says, Here is the fate God allots to the wicked. So I'm about to tell you the truth, he says. The heritage of a ruthless man receives from the Almighty his children. Their fate is the sword. His offspring will never have enough to eat. The plague is going to get them. They're going to have all kinds of trouble, verse 16. So, see, this is uh, uh, a word that we never use. Good thing we have a big board. Retributive? Have you used that word today? Okay. <laughs> well, you can see the word retribution in it. <clears throat> yeah. So the wicked, they're, they're bad people. God's going to give it to them. They're going to get it from God. This is, this is kind of the classic view of suffering back in those days with the Hebrews. You do bad, 
you're going to get it. God's going to punch you. Your descendants are in trouble. No clothes, no food, nothing. See, verse 18, the house he builds is like a moth's cocoon, a hut made by a watchman. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. He'll open up his eyes and everything will be gone. Terror, east wind, hurls itself against him without mercy, verse 22. Claps his hands in derision, hisses him out of place. So, that's sort of, in Job's mind, that's the classic view, retribution. You did bad, you got punished by God. Now, I bring that up, Job says, because I didn't do bad. Why is all this happening to me? Aren't we a lot like that today? Well, uh, <clears throat> sounds like it, the answer could be yes on that one. Again, that's, what we, that's why we read scriptures, so our lives can be different. We can learn from things. Let's say one quick word out of chapter 28, and then we'll pick it up next time. In chapter 29, can you remember that? <laughs> Not enough fingers are in big trouble. Uh, but anyway, chapter 28, uh, he's going to start to, and I want you to see this, as he's going to start to weave this in. He's going to talk about wisdom. 28, verse 1, there is a mine for silver, a place where gold is refined, iron taken from the earth, copper smelted from more mortals put an end to the darkness so he's, he's beginning to introduce something that says there is a, something we can learn from he uses all these ores uh, verse 6 lapis lazuli comes from rocks so he's talking about there's sources to learn things there's sources that we can grow from verse 11 they search the sources of the river and bring, and bring hidden things to light what is he talking about? Here it is in verse 12. Do you have the word wisdom? Yes? Yes? yes. 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 Okay. So this is, this is where the book is kind of, or Job's speech, I should say, <clears throat> is turning a little bit. Where can wisdom be found? <clears throat> he talks about how it's better than all those precious gems that he had just talked about. Verse 17, neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Verse, verse 20, where, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? And here's the positive thing, verse 23, God understands the way to it. He alone knows where it dwells. And the last thing to say as we head off to church, 28, as he says to the people, the fear of the Lord, that is what? Wisdom. 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 That's also in the Proverbs. Sure. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Right. And see, this is, this is what this book is about. This book is wisdom literature. We've said that since day one. And again, fear doesn't mean being afraid of God means having a relationship with God. This is the starting point for every wise thing you'll ever have in your life. The more you know God, the longer you got, know God, perhaps the more your wisdom increases. <clears throat> we become less judgmental. We become more ministerial. The fear of the Lord, this is wisdom. So we'll see how this plays out for the rest of the book. Job's got a few more stuff, things to say. And then all of a sudden we're going to have two surprises in the book. Hmm. Maybe three. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for bringing us wisdom. We need wisdom. You told us to ask for it. We need wisdom. It's found in our relationship with you. Be with us as we minister to those around us. Help us to understand better than we understand today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, we'll see you guys. Let's head off to church. Good to see you people with us. Respect is good. I like that. What, are you counting that as exercise or something? Yeah. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Hello, thank you.